Thank you very much. I mean, it's a fantastic workshop. Um, I learned a lot. It's a great opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity to present and share our perspective here from, from Göttingen. This is a generic uh, scene here. Uh, we are experimentalists, X-ray scientists. Here's a source, some illumination, a sample. Here's a, a detection device, uh, the Fox. And uh, of course, uh, that's an inverse problem kind of fox that knows the wave equation, but that may also be able to, uh, to, uh, to learn. She may also be able to, to, to learn and get better at predicting her prey or uh, you know, the sample. So uh, it all starts in uh, X-ray optics with the problem that we have in uh, uh, achieving um, sufficiently uh, high quality images by lenses. Uh, our our uh, uh, lenses are of uh, extreme, uh, extremely small uh, numerical aperture compa compared to the wavelength. This has been the topic uh, yesterday as, as well. So we are limited by these diffraction structures. In the end, and on uh, Jakob's uh, poster, you can see that we still like to use optics, but uh, we, we don't want the image to be, to be really limited by, by, by that. And this is why we need phase retrieval and recovery. Now, here's, uh, if you think about X-ray imaging or microscopy, there are entirely different starting points from which you can design an experiment. You may come up and say, hey, let's look at the, at the uh, optical microscope with some condenser system, some objective uh, zone plate lens, and let's, uh, let's form an image like this. And you may also start and, and, and just uh, do wave propagation, free space propagation in a divergent beam to get a magnified hologram. Completely different approach. You then will need a computer to, to reconstruct your, your signal, your data, to you know, absorption and phase image. You can also uh, interchange from you know, this self-interference, which is a near-field phenomenon, to a far-field Fourier uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, relationship, and then do phase retrieval. And, and we all have these these different choices. Um, mathematically, we are in a mathematics uh, building or center here. It, 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 you know, it's something like engineering here with our system matrix A. So this, this is supposed to be A, not A for absorption, but uh, you know, a large matrix. And then maybe we use some regularization. So the entire world of experiment, you could map maybe to something like a Tikhonov regularization or something like this. We can design our experiment. We, can, we try to take a lot of data and uh, um, uh, get enough uh, diversity in the data. Uh, we worry about the uh, quality of reconstruction. And, uh, you know, formally, if everything was linear and so forth, we could probably uh, uh, get a regularized uh, um, uh, reconstruction here, but, you know, using the transpose and, and, and so forth uh, of, of these matrices, both in the data fidelity term and the regularization term. But, here's a large but, is A, is the system matrix for, you know, any of the experiments that I showed you, is it at all linear, is it nonlinear? Of course, uh, if it's nonlinear, can we sufficiently well linearize locally? Is it too large? Is it well conditioned, exact? And how can we change the structure of the data and of uh, A? So a lot to design. Of course, it's not linear due to the uh, you know, intensity observation. And it's really large. Uh, typically, for experiments that we do, we have 10 to the 7 times 10 to the 7 as a system matrix. Because you know, here we write um, uh, all our image in, in one column vector. It um, may not be well conditioned, but maybe we can change it. We can change, uh, you know, the conditioning of the matrix. Uh, we'll worry about the singularity in the eigenvalue spectrum, so forth. Is it exact? It won't be exact because whatever we do in, in modeling the forward problem, there's there are some artifacts that will always be uh, present. And in particular, uh, as we go to high resolution nanoscale imaging, we will have aberrations also in the forward model. And then, of course, also vibrations, drift, uh, dynamic samples. Uh, so it's not even um, uh, time independent. And we saw in Michael Unze's talk that you can compensate even by these, by these uh, methods. So probably this won't go uh, uh, a long way here, our inversion formula. And here's, here's the team. Here's the team. You've met uh, Jakob Zolter, who has uh, presented his work uh, um, uh, on the poster. 
And I will show uh, work here by uh, also Marina Eckermann and, and showing an application. Uh, Jens and Simon have been worked on the inverse problem, regularization approach, Leon as, 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 uh, as well. A number of uh, really outstanding past and present uh, PhD students and uh, Markus Osterhoff as a permanent uh, researcher uh, in the group. And we have collaborators in, in, in the Department of uh, Mathematic Mathematics in Göttingen. We also have a center, a third party funding center, funded center, which is called Mathematics of Experiments. So a little bit the same spirit as here at the EPUM to bring in experimental disciplines with a lot of data and people that are knowledgeable about you know, uniqueness and inversion strategies and, and algorithms and so forth. There's, uh, for instance, Thorsten Hohage, Bernhard Schmitzer, Russell Luke is in, in the center, um, uh, and Axel Munk and, and others. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. I'll um, talk, I'll present uh, to you first, you know, the basics of near-field X-ray imaging by holography. This is our main approach, and we bring this, of course, to computer tomography. I will then talk a bit about uh, advanced phase retrieval, how we can push uh, the limit in this problem. I'll give you a, a current benchmark. That's a neuroscience uh, application, human brain tissue imaging, and uh, a little bit uh, towards the outlook, towards higher resolution. How can we go, let's say, from brain architectonics to connectomics? We heard about uh, in Sebastian Sung's uh, talk yesterday, great uh, uh, capabilities that we have with electrons, but there's also a, a probably an opportunity to uh, scale it up with x-rays and uh, also beyond just spatial resolution in space and time using you know um, single pulse uh, uh, um, imaging at XFEL in the end if I have time. So let's start with um, you know just taking from a, one of my lectures absorption CT uh, everybody uh, may know how that works here we have a small patient it's actually a mouse chest x-ray, it's in our lab, so it's fairly high resolution, pure absorption-based imaging. So, so that concept is, is purely based on geometric uh, optics. And uh, as you know, we take a complete set of data, one rotation. Um, uh, that's not too trivial to, to say what is a complete uh, well-sampled uh, set. But here for parallel beam, let's say uh, over 180 degrees, sufficient number of uh, projections. We write each line into a sinogram, and in the simplest case, uh, and this is uh, entirely linear, Radon and inverse Radon transform uh, by a filtered back projection, you can see how that particular slice comes out. And you can do the same for the entire family of, of planes. And we start to see not only you know, the high density tissues, but uh, also uh, the lung tissue to some, some degree. Now, um, even in this simple geometric optic problem without any phase uh, contrast uh, effects taken into account yet, there are challenges and the tremendous challenges uh, um, which also deserve in inverse problem kind of treatment. And of course, mathematical tomography is a big field. Um, uh, before and all, I mean, the, the uh, necessary sampling uh, conditions are tremendous. For instance, suppose that you wanted to map each neuron in, in, in the entire um, human brain, you would probably need um, 10 to the 5 uh, projections uh, to do this based on the Crotha criterion and the number of resolution elements in, in one uh, dimension. So if that's not possible, uh, can we have uh, low uh, resolution overviews and then zoom into a, a region of interest? Yeah? And how, how well can we solve that problem that is inconsistent because we won't be able to reconstruct yeah, the entire sample and there will be parts of the sample coming in and out. Yeah? In this problem of local uh, uh, tomography or region of interest uh, um, tomography. Um, uh, what, what we are dealing with in this case is that you have a truncated sinogram. Yeah? You have the entire sample here. This is uh, a simulated uh, uh, you know, toy example. We would need the entire uh, sample to be uh, resolved, but our detector is small only like this. And this is inconsistent data. How can we clean this to get just the components from you know, within the field of view? And it turns out that uh, if you have support constraints and if you, uh, if you require, for instance, the difference, uh, um, uh, uh, the difference sinogram between uh, what you measured and what you reproject from a certain iteration of your region, you want that difference not 
you want it always to be finite because you don't want to explain you know, the, uh, the, uh, the contributions that move in and out. So that uh, difference uh, should be finite and it should have a support. It should have contributions in, in 2D space here which are not in the center but which are uh, you know, outside somehow. So we can add a ring here outside and push these components um, out and then we can convince ourselves that we can get um, a, a good local consistent tomography. So there's a tremendous uh, opportunity in, in this and uh, many, many um, uh, good uh, mathematical works. But uh, let's go back to you know, the face retrieval problem and let's uh, make a higher resolution experiment and do ROI tomography on just one part of the lung and expect for some, some better visibility for the uh, soft tissues. Yeah? We could take a higher resolution detector, for instance, at this uh, liquid, uh, liquid X-ray uh, jet source, and uh, we reconstruct that data. It looks uh, promising, yeah? more features. We want to see the uh, small alveola, the functional tissue, the parenchyme of the lung. But uh, without treating this, you know, um, phase effect and the partial coherence, probably uh, it, it looks very noisy and inconsistent. And only if we really apply some sort of phase retrieval, we get now very good gray values and we can see that we can uh, work our way forward where we have a, a larger whole uh, chest uh, overview of the mouse in absorption contrast. But then if we go into the measured region of interest down here, the, the, the large uh, uh, airways and bronchi, we can see that we have some region at high resolution. We can, in fact, uh, map each and every alveoli here, if these, uh, these tiny air sacs uh, in, in lung tissue. So that's, uh, that's promising. That's both phase contrast and uh, local tomography. And it's, uh, it's um, uh, at a compact source, which, which is good. This is, in fact, much better than phase contrast tomographies 20 years ago at the synchrotron. So uh, all these uh, efforts, both lab and synchrotron, uh, uh, are strongly improving. And uh, we started with this uh, 10 years ago or so, in the, uh, you know, looking at uh, excised uh, cochlea and a project where we wanted to see uh, nerve tissue inside of bony uh, structure. And if you optimize and understand your, your forward problem and your resolution, you can really get this added uh, data quality that helps in segmentation. And you can see nerve tissue inside of bones. So that's, that's a, a long way. That is, that's uh, a long time ago. And that was uh, uh, more microanatomy. We still do this uh, in the lab, but uh, 10 years later now we can really uh, be more ambitious and bring this to the fact where we say, okay, let's reconstruct each and every neuron in, in uh, let's say, in, uh, this is a particular type of neurons, so-called spiral neural ganglion uh, cells in cochlea. This is no longer dried, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kept in, in liquid. It is, in fact, uh, in this case, a synchrotron data set. But uh, uh, along this, this line, it's, uh, there's a, a lot to do. And um, uh, in particular, we have a goal to really contribute to, uh, let's say, the science of tissues, to histology and histopathology. If you think about histopathology, that's a routine uh, technique in each uh, university as um, a pathology unit. You have to inspect uh, tissues and you do this by sectioning, by, by uh, uh, taking the ultratome and having thin sections and, and using optical microscopy. It really started 150 years ago and from, from the imaging, of course, we have now different stains and um, genetic expressions and more readout and contrast, but in the imaging, it's pretty much what, what's been around for a long, long time, and uh, it's incredibly important to, to uh, unravel what, what diseases do and also to go to a certain you know, diagnosis for certain patients if you have a biopsy. It's, so it's, it's not only the post-mortem side of, uh, uh, let's say, seeing what actually uh, was lethal to, to that patient or what went, went wrong, uh, or how the uh, disease develops, but also for, for diagnostics. And um, now I think that face contrast X-ray uh, tomography can really bring, uh, um, extend the classical uh, um, histology from two dimensions, uh, this is the typical H&E stain, to three dimension. This is, this is uh, let's say, an example of human lung tissue. We've seen a large scale overview and then a cone beam reconstruction here uh, close to an artery, where you see pretty, 
pretty interesting structures that, that, are, that inform the pathologies uh, of, of what, what, what happens. And since um, these techniques have matured and we have access to both laboratory and synchrotron, uh, you could quickly respond, for instance, in, in COVID-19, and we could help the pathologists to ask questions on infiltration with lymphocytes, with immune cells, on their density, on metrics of how alveolar walls thicken if there's a really, uh, uh, let's say, a severe progression of the uh, diseases. And um, most importantly, also to use 3D reconstructions to see how blood vessels uh, split as a response to distress and oxygen uh, uh, ischemic uh, conditions, uh, the blood vessels uh, spread in lung. And uh, this then gets clogged by trombi. And you can see this is actually lung and this is heart. Uh, we then use segmentation to see how you know, healthy and pathological states differ, where you have something that certainly you don't want in your blood vessel systems, in your vasculature, uh, uh, any loops. Yeah? And you can use also graph theory to, to, uh, um, to quantify this. But these are um, just uh, examples. Um, and what that tells us is that these full, full uh, uh, field views and uh, just one angular range, that, that goes a long way because you can really tailor your resolution and your field of view and uh, you can see large um, 3D volumes. So uh, let's think about the phase uh, uh, retrieval problem here. For that problem, fairly simple. You have a uh, 3D object. And uh, for now, we hold that uh, there's a projection approximation if it's thin enough. If not, we should go to, you know, what George was uh, presenting us and uh, solving the uh, Lippmann-Schwinger equation or multi-slicing or something uh, of that sort. But then in the simplest case, the question is how that wave field uh, behind the sample, how that evolves. And of course, if your detector is too close, uh, you detect in intensities. Uh, if that's a soft tissue and just face information, you don't uh, see any contrast. And then contrast emerges as a function of this unitless uh, Fresnel number by self-interference. And you're more sensitive to small uh, differences in, 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 in tissue and phase shift if you go to high defocus distances, small Fresnel numbers, but now your samples, your, your image will be uh, uh, less and less sharp and you, you are in, a, in, a, in, in, let's say, uh, in more need of uh, sharpening through phase uh, retrieval. Yeah? You really have to go, credit to Dennis Gabor, in his times, no computational reconstruction reconstruction possible, so that was really photographic film. And he took this as a sample and used back propagation to reconstruct, you know, a holographic image. And that's, of course, not very good. Yeah, that, that uh, is uh, flawed by, uh, by, uh, by uh, let's say, um, uh, twin images. And the question is, how do you get a sharp reconstruction here? Uh, how do you get back from what you measure to what, you know, the sample was? So, um, uh, in the simplest case, projection approximation, that means your axis wave will have some phase and some, some amplitude contrasts, which are both, you know, functions of uh, uh, R2. And uh, then you put this in the Fresnel propagator and uh, your measurement will be modulus squared. So this will be the nonlinear operator if you combine the uh, exponential and the Fresnel. Uh, this will be one um, nonlinear operator with you know, just uh, one parameter for null number acting on, you know, the complex valued uh, um, uh, wave field. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, how you write the Fresnel operator. Now you can linearize the exponential for small phase shift or weakly varying phase actually, and uh, absorption, then you can bring this, you can write this as a linear uh, forward uh, uh, operator. And if you take a Tikhonov uh, a reg um, regular um, uh, functional of the linear problem, you can, you can write the uh, solution very quickly. For instance, here for let's say the case where you assume an homogeneous object. So we, we think of uh, the uh, absorption and the phase uh, property being both linked to local density and you could, uh, uh, strictly speaking, and this is only true for, let's say, same uh, stoichiometry. It's a rather harsh approximation, but that's what everybody uses. And you can more or less 
uh, then take your images, uh, Fourier transform, subtract the one, and understand these images as weighted superpositions of your Fourier transform, of your absorption, and your phase image, with the weight functions being oscillations in in uh, in the spatial frequencies. Yeah, that's that's the the famous uh, uh, linear contrast transfer function formalism. So that's that's really 99% of of uh, synchrotron, you know, near field phase contrast CTs are re using this, this, this formalism. And it's, it's decent if the sample is not too strong. You get a decent uh, uh, reconstruction. But uh, it's, uh, it's not good enough. And there's also a further challenge. What I showed you so far is, is parallel beam. So, so far, so good. But you actually want to magnify. So you have to have a, a, a good point source to illuminate your sample and get, get magnification into this. Turns out that uh, that uh, this wave optical scheme of cone beam uh, preserves uh, you know, geometric magnification. So so it's you can you can you can uh, measure in this configuration and calculate in in the equivalent parallel beam um, down you know magnified uh, geometry. But uh, there are um, pitfalls, and in particular, um, if you focus, you get a lot of aberrations. So in many, um, not many instruments show you their raw data. It may look like this. You have a lot of, for instance, this is a, uh, a data recorded with the KB mirror. We see a lot of phase artifacts. This is the, uh, what you measure with the sample in the beam. That's the empty beam. And this is only after dividing by the intensities of the empty beam that you, you know, see your sample. You see a lot of uh, um, uh, artifacts because, you know, you should be dividing in the sample plane and you should be dividing in, in complex valued fields and not uh, intensities. So uh, to, to reduce these errors, we we uh, uh, try to use very smooth, very Gaussian kind of uh, illuminations. We focus, we, we filter the incoming radiation by guided, uh, um, by waveguides. And these guided modes then um, uh, make a better match to this flawed uh, correction step. Yeah? And also, it, it means that, that you, can, you can reduce your um, exit waveform further by these uh, guided modes. So, so that's an experimental challenge, how to put this really to work, how to build an instrument for this nanoscale holography. There are a few out there at many synchrotron, at, you know, at, at, at uh, all uh, synchrotron um, uh, uh, sources. And uh, we work a lot here at the Petra, uh, Petra, it's not yet Petra 4, it's Petra 3 for now, storage ring at, at, at DAISY, where we were able to you know, build a, a, an instrument for, for these, these measurements uh, together with DAISY. So if, if the CTF, the linearized model, is not good enough, uh, how can we go to more advanced uh, phase retrieval? And how can we improve uh, on this? Aha, yeah, this is now the right, uh, the, the right comparison. You've seen the, the, uh, uh, you know, the phantom here in this simulation. And this is the holographic, the Gabor uh, reconstruction. That's the CTF reconstruction. But then on, let's say, simulated data with some noise, you can also show that you can get this type of quality if you use you know, out-of-the-box iterative uh, 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 phase retrieval schemes uh, uh, like, uh, like RA, which uh, would implement your measurement and some sample constraints such as you know, uh, a support or a pure phase object or sparsity, uh, many different um, uh, options that, that regularize uh, this and uh, that uh, uh, give you something uh, without these limitations of linearization. But typically, these methods take uh, a lot of uh, iterations. And uh, you can see that where, uh, you know, in some test samples, you can have a, uh, artifacts uh, here in these, uh, these uh, small beads in, uh, with the rather strong gradients in phase. And the reconstruction in linearized uh, theory is bad. But these iterative algorithms, algorithms manage to cope with this. If you can really get you know, from the hologram to nice reconstructions uh, exploiting this uh, beyond linearization. But um, it comes at a cost. And now uh, can't we push these, uh, you know, single step methods a little bit further? How about um, bringing uh, the uh, contrast transfer function from a linear um, model to a nonlinear model? And before even um, tackling this, can we get away with this 
ubiquitous assumption of a homogeneous object, which we really don't like, yeah, because phase and um, amplitude are really uh, independently varying. So um, there's a just, uh, you can do this, uh, turns out it doesn't, it doesn't uh, take uh, much uh, cost at all if you just write this uh, problem as a, in a matrix uh, form and you can use even this formal uh, inversion to show that how you can calculate from a number of images, sufficient number of images, you can, you can really reconstruct uh, both without this flawed uh, assumption and if you have this homogeneous CTF on you know, real data, but uh, taking with two kind of different beads, glass beads and plastic beads, you can see that, that tuning your reconstruction parameter to one of them will always give you some you know, uh, variation here in your reconstruction which, which uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, look very well, even if this is still a linear problem. And the inhomogeneous CTF can overcome this. That's very good. There are still artifacts due to this linearization. So I told you, you can also go a little bit beyond this and uh, use uh, a, a nonlinear Tikhonov um, um, functional yeah, with the full operator here and iteratively solve this yeah, by uh, maybe local uh, linearizations. And then you can also include constraints into this. And when we did this, uh, we really get a very nice improvements. Maybe it's not so drastic, but overall, it really makes a big difference. These are, these are um, stained neurons in neuronal tissue by CTF and by nonlinear Tikhonov. And uh, this is, oops, uh, the mouse is a bit difficult to handle. This is, uh, again, the bead example. So we get the quality we want even from these much faster methods uh, compared to uh, just iterative propagation projection algorithms because we sort of encode the nature of the forward problem and we have uh, functional derivatives uh, and so forth and that was ingeniously implemented here and, and worked out by uh, uh, Simon Hoon in, in, in the group and this is published in Optics Express by now. So we can compare different approaches also in 3D. This is tomograms of cells and we can convince ourselves that that, 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 that works well. But essentially, uh, a single cell in 3D, you don't really need hard x-rays for this. There are many other um, techniques that can, can tackle this. And uh, so it's, uh, we, we should do uh, larger samples, unique problems for x-rays like, like tissues. But one, one more current uh, idea just here, as we go through larger samples, um, uh, in some early work we found that, that um, uh, one good way to go further is to mix uh, tomography and uh, face retrieval because this um, uh, tomographic consistency of your sample really stabilizes the low spatial frequencies in, in Fourier space. If you think about the Fourier slice theorem, different uh, projections have a finite um, width because uh, of the finite uh, support or extent of sample or beam and that means different slices inform each other and uh, if, you, if you solve uh, now in, in, a, in a joint uh, approach, uh, for instance, like in algebraic uh, tomography, you always have a 3D iterate um, and you can project out to, to get to a certain uh, plane and, and, and then do a little bit of, let's say, phase retrieval on the projections, but then reconstruct again and mix the information from different uh, projection angles. If you did this, uh, you can see a tremendous um, it's a, it's a very powerful constraint by itself. Yeah? You don't, you, for instance, you don't need a, a, a support constraint. Even if you just have, and this is a drastic example here of uh, Eike Ruland, who worked this out in his uh, PhD at the time, uh, you want to face one, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, angle, but you, you still have, you over-parameterize your sample, and you say, I, I still build a 3D sample. I, uh, I arrange my uh, voxels so that one projection, uh, you know, should work out. And of course, uh, there are an infinite uh, degeneration of problems, not an infinite, but many different solutions for the same project, for the same uh, 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 projection angle. Um, you may get uh, something with range constraints, maybe uh, positive, positive definiteness or so, that, that looks like this. But if you, if you work uh, on at least a, another projection, uh, you can see that this improves. And um, even uh, you know, with a, a number of projections, which are not sufficient to, to solve the, th uh, the 3D problem, this one or you know, the selected number of uh, pro projections that you mix, 
um, become uh, much uh, better uh, reconstructed. Again, this, this phantom here in the simulation, but we also showed that for um, experiments. Okay, oh, well, yeah. Um, so what, 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 uh, what remains to be done? Well, um, we worried a lot about idealizing assumptions and imaging inexactness. Uh, we have not only Poisson noise, which is you know, the easiest to add to your simulations and always present in experiment, but also coherence, finite bandwidths, beam distortions, and if you put all of them together, your reconstruction of your phantom may look like this, whereas your phantom looks like that. Um, but you can sort of uh, try to uh, work on each of these um, you know, um, real world frontiers, for instance, coherence by using more modes uh, and, and so forth, and uh, distortions by uh, um, reconstructing whatever distorts your sample. And, uh, that's, that's, that continues to be an important, um, uh, important part of our work. So all of these developments, where does that bring us now? Let's look at a, a, a current example, three imaging of soft tissues. It's neuronal um, tissue, uh, central nervous system, human uh, tissue. And uh, there's a tremendous... Um, um, you know, program and activity in, 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 in brain mapping, even um, uh, on scales where you not, do not g uh, yet um, address the connectomics, but just the architecture of tissue, like neurons and, and, and larger fiber tracts and different brain regions, it's important to refine, you know, the classical uh, atlases and to put uh, together multimodal data um, there's a big uh, European uh, uh, human brain atlas uh, project where you sort of, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, a Google Maps kind of approach to the human brain at scales which connect, let's say, um, 3D histology, clinical data on larger scale, macroscopic data, MRI, and, and uh, uh, so forth. And uh, X-ray phase contrast tomography can, can contribute to this. Um, in fact, we have some data now deposited in that, uh, in that framework of that atlas. And this is uh, the example that I'll be showing. So for that work, uh, we will be uh, focusing on certain brain regions. We started, for instance, with the uh, human cerebellum here, which is responsible for motion control, uh, very densely packed cells in the granular layer. Um, but the example that I show you now is, is the hippocampal uh, tissue from humans. And, we wanted to uh, understand how the cytio architecture changes from healthy to pathological um, states associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we had a cohort of postmortem tissue uh, samples um, uh, of uh, Alzheimer um, positive uh, subjects and, and control age matched uh, control uh, samples and. Uh, so the first task was to uh, um, measure these samples uh, with a multi-scale approach. That was work uh, with Marina Eckermann in her PhD. She is now a postdoc at the European uh, Synchrotron Facility at uh, the Holotomography Beamline ID16. And here is what typically you start with. We collaborate with our neuropathology department, Christina Stadelmann and her team. And you can sort of identify your target region. This is the dentite uh, gyrus, uh, the different uh, subfields of the hippocampus. And now you can uh, sort of stitch tomogram by tomogram here with, let's say, a 650 nanometer voxel size to cover something like uh, eight millimeters in, in cross section and have thousands of slices uh, uh, or several layers uh, even um, uh, to be inspected. And um, in earlier work, we had already seen that you can match, uh, that you can, can see in, in, in um, pathological context of Alzheimer's disease, you can identify plugs. And uh, this is actually a, a correlative uh, result here from 2D um, uh, stains with conventional histology. And that's the X-ray reconstruction. That's in-house data, actually, in that case. That was parallel beam uh, synchrotron uh, uh, data. Uh, here again, the data quality of in-house uh, data, where we looked at not 
a sample series, but individual samples where you know we knew that was an post-mortem tissue from an Alzheimer's per, uh, um, subject uh, suffering from Alzheimer's. You see these mineralized the plaques, for instance. You can locate them with respect to the blood vessels, and um, then if you see some something suspicious of your interest, you can you can after the X-ray tomogram you can cut and you can stain and you can show actually that that uh, you know certain features composed of uh, beta amyloid uh, or so. That's that's very powerful because on the uh, on uh, some instances you can make the connection, but then you have the recall of the entire volume to uh, to to analyze. And um, uh, uh, so you start with large uh, overviews. Uh, this is this is this bended structure of the dendrite gyrus, which is intersected by blood vessels. Um, uh, this is parallel beam synchrotron data, and then it's segmented uh, uh, all of these neurons, or more precisely, the nuclei of these neurons. It's paraffin embedded, unstained tissue, and we can go into a region of interest, and then. Um, uh, see at higher resolution um, into, let's say, a certain area and uh, also exploit uh, sub-organelle uh, resolution. This is really de the density distribution of a single um, nuclear, a nucleus, uh, cellular nucleus of uh, a neuron uh, packed in the dentite gyrus and we know exactly where those punches or that paraffin block was, was taken. So there's, there's a lot of control. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that was that's face that's phase contrast. Just just the intrinsic density difference of tissue with respect to paraffin. Yeah, that <coughs> that that is sufficient in this case. Segment here the granular neurons and to to uh, you know uh, also get information on their shape, electron density, the density variance, the heterogeneity of these nuclei, the volume, the sphericity, and we can do this for let's say. Um, hundred thousands, uh, up to a million of cells per per individual. Um, in the high resolution scan, it's more like uh, a few ten thousand uh, um, uh, neurons, and then we can uh, uh, map this into a feature space where each neuron is characterized by five structural features. Um, and then uh, each uh, subject uh, would correspond to a, po uh, a point cloud, uh, and with all the respective cells represented, and then we ask how much does that differ between different individuals. So rather than to t-testing any uh, median or mean values, we take the entire 3D um, distribution, but not in real space, but in feature space. And of course, real space metrics could also be a feature, like number of nearest neighbors and so forth. Uh, we also exploit this. And then uh, we want to see what are the differences uh, in a, a certain number of uh, uh, subjects. What are the main modes? But uh, this uh, requires metrics and a representation in a patient space that is not um, a priori linear. So uh, we have to uh, define a barycenter and linearize in that you know, a space that is constructed from optimal transport metrics. And we can then locally linearize and do PCA and see where are the changes. And only afterwards we can put in the, the clinical staging and say, okay, this is uh, uh, the control and this is the Alzheimer uh, group. Um, this is the uh, uh, the first step to do this is of course to to uh, segment the gray value data to really have individual annotated nuclei yeah? in this case uh, items. And then this is a 2D uh, uh, projection of a cloud, uh, point cloud of uh, one sample. For instance, uh, in the space heterogeneity and density of the, of the nuclei. And then uh, we can compare different uh, individuals uh, and, and, and different groups. But uh, uh, exploiting these uh, optimal transport uh, uh, tools, um, and, um, you know, for instance, uh, taking out uh, two PCA modes in this linear uh, tangent space around the population mean, uh, we can then afterwards color here for the neuropathological staging, and we can see that there is a, a tie line here for classification, the SVM classifier, and that allows us to define or to identify the um, 
the pathway from physi physiology to physiological to patho pathological structure. What we see here is represented by these histograms. We can, we can see that the uh, nuclei shrink, become more compact and more heterogeneous. And we interpret this by, uh, let's say, an increased uh, um, a number of uh, heterochromatin versus uh, euchromatin. So the cells go into a senescent state. Yeah? And uh, uh, this is completely new. It wasn't a hypothesis when we started, but it came out of this analysis. Now, uh, Hung Jung tells me one, one minute. Uh, so I haven't, been, uh, uh, I haven't been very careful uh, about my time. Um, let's just ask uh, for, to finish off, uh, what are the options now to go to connectomics, to uh, focus uh, uh, more into a certain region and to combine this architecture with, let's say, circuit uh, information. And this is unclear whether X-rays can make a contribution, um, but it's also clear that the uh, ability of, uh, of uh, Electrons in, in going to, to large volumes are quite limited and going to more than one individual are quite limited. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very worthwhile frontier for X-rays. It will require staining, uh, of course, and maybe um, higher resolution techniques. And uh, this is work uh, by Jakob, which was on, presented on the poster where we use uh, uh, this uh, completely different holography approach without empty beam division and taking really pixel detectors and the direct uh, Fourier, uh, uh, you know, propagator, uh, and that exploits us, allows us to exploit holographic and diffractive signal, and we can show that this really goes to 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 the uh, resolution level that we need of 10 nanometer in 2D. Now we have to bring this to 3D and to to build instruments that can really do this. For instance, at Petra at Petra 4 different schemes, uh, uh, and I will leave out, I guess, the high spatial and temporal resolution that, that also requires a very special phase retrieval technique, um, and, and, you know, pulse by pulse imaging, radial um, distributions, still uh, a lot on the road ahead, and I travel back from this workshop with many good ideas and things. Hey, let's, let's look this up, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for this, and I'm Grateful, of course, uh, to the team and the collaborators, and thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you.